Let's get started then. I have confirmed you can hear me. So today's webinar is brought to you by CyberHoot. We are a learning management solution that goes well beyond learning management. And we do a whole bunch of other things. We are not a commercial. This is not gonna be a commercial today for CyberHoot, though I hope you'll consider coming to join us and benefit from our cyber program and development. What today is all about are 10 tips for a practical and effective cybersecurity program for any MSP or SMB. Years ago, um, years ago, Donald Rumsfeld got up to the podium and he said, took a, took a question from a, a reporter in the audience and who said, uh, hey Donald, what keeps you up at night? And he said, very cryptically, the things I don't know, I don't know. And everybody signed, kind of scratched their heads and they said, well, what the heck does that mean? And he said, let me explain. <clears throat> there are things that I know I don't know. Those are the known unknowns. And I have really smart people working on those things to figure them out, find the solution, bring it to me, and we execute on it. But the things I don't see coming are the unknown unknowns. Those are the curveballs, the things that cause the greatest damage to the United States and the things that keep me up at night. So that's the answer to your question. Fast forward to 2020, you're on a webinar and Craig's talking about unknown unknowns and known unknowns and what does he mean? Cybersecurity for the majority of SMB owners and a good majority, a good number of MSP owners is all about unknown unknowns. The business owners you talk to as an MSP, they know that cyber matters, but they don't know why, they don't know what it's about, they don't know what to do about it. And it's a bit of a mercurial science to them and they just don't have the facts. So the, the hidden message for today's me, uh, meeting is, learn what you don't know you don't know and how you're gonna sell it to your clients potentially as an MSP. Okay, so we're gonna go through those things and some of the lessons you'll learn today, you can turn around and use to address the unknown unknowns with your clients. So let's get started. Who the heck is Craig? We're going to go over that. We're going to go over cybercrime primer, who's attacking us. What are the common types of malware they're using to attack us with? What did Datto, for instance, say? You're probably, many of you might be using uh, uh, Datto's Autotask tool if you're an MSP. If not, then you're in Continuum or Kaseya. There's probably maybe one person on from Ninjio or something like that, but that's the that's 95% of the users. So Datto had a really good report on ransomware. We'll touch on that for a moment. We're gonna talk about why SMBs and MSPs for that matter are attacked so often versus larger companies in the enterprise space or smaller companies. <clears throat> and then we're gonna go through a little cybersecurity preparedness to protect your brand. We're gonna go over the 10 things you ought to do to protect your business as an MSP, and then turn around and protect your clients' businesses uh, for a fee, for a price, for a cost, right? You're gonna line item this to them. And these are some of those areas. We're gonna get into two training exercises and feel free to steal these or go back to the Facebook Live post, which we're live on uh, CyberHoot's Facebook page to get to these training exercises because they're quite valuable for opening the eyes of employees or, or business owners when you're sitting across the table from them. Uh, we're gonna talk about passwords, why they matter, what's password hygiene, how do you get that? Strong or good hygiene that is, and how to spot and avoid and delete phishing attacks. Um, we have a little bit of an overview of one of our MSPs and what they've accomplished, what they were facing, what they've accomplished. I don't think Tim's gonna be able to join us today um, I think he's on vacation, so uh, we'll be just ad-libbing that portion of it. And we'll go from there. Sound like a plan, everyone? So who is Craig? Back 25 years ago, I worked for a managed service provider in Rochester, Minnesota, supporting the Mayo Clinic and a bunch of other businesses um, with managed IT. It was an MSP 25 years ago called Venture Computer Systems. You can tell by the logo how low res it is. Uh, since that time, I've gone, I worked for a company called Secure Computing, a manufacturer of firewalls. 
uh, Computer Sciences Corporation spent a good long time building cybersecurity programs for the likes of DuPont, um, Citizens Bank, Bose, at Computer Sciences Corporation in their web hosting um, business unit. I worked for Vistaprint on their national uh, global cybersecurity lead for their manufacturing business and all of their businesses globally. Chase Payment Tech in their financial arm with merchant underwriting as well as, oh, interesting. That's interesting. I just got texted that we're seeing me, not the PowerPoint. So I must have shared the uh, wrong item. So thank you for that, Tim. Let me pick the right screen that I'm supposed to be sharing here. I thought I was sharing this screen here. So that is screen number two, share that. This might be a little bit more easier for you to follow. So my apologies, thank you, Tim. Uh, yeah, so backing up, Venture, Secure, CSE, Vistaprint, Chase Payment Tech, Neoscope, where I'm the uh, lead inf or chief information security officer, as well as, um, there's a lot of screens here, CyberHoop. So six years ago, I went and decided to found my own company, CyberHoop, to address a gap that I saw in the awareness training solutions out on the marketplace for the SMB, for the small to medium-sized business owner, the person with you know five people to 500 people. And I've used my time at Neoscope to build CyberHoot into the product it is today, fully informed by MSPs, by Neoscope as an MSP for what our clients needed to protect themselves. And, and so there's gonna be a flavor of that throughout. So let's move on to who's attacking us, what their motivations are, and we'll go from there. We're sort of gonna bootstrap you on Cybersecurity 101 for just a moment, just to make sure, I'm sure many of you know this, but some of you might need a little refresher. And so we'll make sure you're all on the same page. Uh, if you remember war games in 1980, there were some young kids trying to break into the Pentagon and do this and do that. And uh, they were kind of on the order of script kitties who were not out to break anything or damage things or steal data. They were just really hacking for fun and notoriety. That's that group. Then came organized crime into the scene probably about a decade ago and probably the largest growing threat we all face as SMBs and MSPs is from organized crime who've realized that it's far easier to make money with impunity online through hacks, hacking and that sort of thing than it is in the real world, especially as more and more camera phones get put up and people, you know, like dealing in goods and services stolen is just so hard these days. Um, they're moving to online attacks with ransomware, hiring companies and not companies, but um, hackers to do their bidding for attacks. And they're hacking obviously for money. Uh, nation states is next. Oops. <clears throat> nation states are hacking for global advantage. These, uh, every country of the world pretty much has a offensive and defensive capability, whether it be uh, China hacking the US, the US hacking China, or you know another really powerful and, and competent hacking uh, country, I think it's number three after Russia, is, um, well, depending on who you ask, the Israelis are always up there in the top three, uh, but Iran, Iran has a really strong cybersecurity attack and defense capability. Uh, many people don't know that. And as you may or may not have heard in the last 48 hours, there was a press announcement that there were um, hacktivists, whether they were nation state sponsored, they said maybe Iran, maybe Russia was involved in influencing our election, but there are also organizations or groups of hacktivists who are, are uh, attempting to influence company behaviors by hacking into say a fishing company because they think the oceans are being pillaged for uh, too much harvesting of whales or fishing. So you can have a hacktivist organization for any um, social cause out there and they might be targeting your company. So this is uh, four main groups. And the last statistics we have on this show in the 2017 breach data from Verizon, these percentages as behind the attacks. 6% uh, for script kitties, 50 for organized crime, 12 for nation states, four for hacktivists. That doesn't add up to 100, so where's the missing number? Well, that's the insider threat. Your own employees at your MSP or at your SMB can be the cause of a breach. Now, it's not always because they are malicious in nature, it's because they make mistakes. 
uh, many of the large database breaches that have come and gone in the history of the internet were accidental because an employee did not set the permissions right and made it world readable. And so hackers came along and said, thank you very much. I'll take all that data. And so it was an accident caused by an insider who made a mistake. And then there's, of course, malicious insiders who do sell for a, for a fee the uh, intellectual property and information they have. But when you add all of that up, that's what the threat uh, groups and actors we are facing as organizations looks like. What are they trying to install? What are they doing? By far and away, the most common is ransomware today. Ransomware has recently gone through an evolution. It used to be in the early days of ransomware, they would encrypt all your files and they'd convince you to pay the ransom to get the decryption key back because our backups weren't perfect, right? We had troubles getting all the files back or we were backing up the wrong thing or we lost some backups or the backups themselves were encrypted because we were overwrote the good backups with the encrypted data and we couldn't get access to it, right? Then we got really, really good as MSPs at backing up data with state checks and you know revision control so that hackers stopped getting paid. So what did they do? They evolved things and they said, hey, we're going to now export the data that we encrypt so you don't have access to it. It's not available unless you get your backups back. We're going to export it and then we're going to publish it online. So uh, the truth of the matter is in the last quarter, Q3 of 2020, healthcare providers who have a lot of really sensitive data experienced a threefold increase in ransomware attacks because they have no choice but to pay the ransom if a health record or series of health records are going to be released online. They can not afford to allow that to happen. There, are, If it's more than 500 records, they have to go to the Health and Human Services and they get on the HIPAA wall of shame and all kinds of bad repercussions to it. They just as soon pay the ransom and uh, get their data back. I'm not advising that on this call that you do or don't pay ransoms. That's a totally different topic and another discussion for another day. Another thing though that hackers are trying to do is they're trying to get remote access Trojans to spy on our data to see what, what information is in your company and is it of interest to me. A lot more nation state approach there. The former uh, ransomware is much more on the front of organized crime. Still other uh, solutions are bot networks. There are many, company, many hackers who are farming Bitcoins to get a valid Bitcoin address because if you get a valid Bitcoin, you got a two grand or seven grand uh, Bitcoin. It's pretty amazing that the, the price has fluctuated quite a bit over the last few years. I'm not 100% clear on what it is today. Uh, there are also questions that come up periodically when I give this presentation. Uh, about cell phones and the question was well is there do we really have to worry about our cell phones and the answer today is you, you kind of do um, I would say that there's a lot of hidden benefits to the closed operating system environment of both Google Play and Apple Play Store that prevent the um, obvious attacks that can occur from downloading, say you wanted to download a piece of software from the internet and install it on your workstation or your laptop at home. You don't know who wrote that. No one's validated it. You think it looks good because the website looks good and you install it and guess what? You could have just compromised your computer. Well, on a mobile device, at least Google and Apple have validated the software somewhat to say it's doing most of the things it says it's doing and we don't think it's doing anything else. Where you get into trouble with mobile applications traditionally is that they want access to your microphone, they want access to your cameras and your personal data, and then they monetize that by selling it to advertisers so that Facebook knows about what you're searching for. Google knows certainly what you're searching for in their apps on their phone. So you have to be careful with the permissions. But if you ask Jeff Bezos, are there malware on mobile devices? He'll say, absolutely. I'm divorced today, Jeff Bezos would say, because of mobile malware. He got a special text one day. It compromised his phone. They stole his pictures and his mistress was published to the internet. Divorce is the natural conclusion of that. So there are things that you need to worry about in your phone. Keep it up to date. Try not to let the permissions be too onerous or too permissive. The latest iOS versions asking me uh, to review the permissions on the applications in the background and the microphone and all of those sorts of things. So that's good. Make sure you're taking care of that. Finally, hackers are looking to install key loggers to steal your passwords because the passwords are still the holy grail for most hackers to get into our email, to get into our uh, critical accounts. 
Uh, so that's what they're trying to do. The different groups that we talked about, these are their tools of the trade. Uh, ransomware is still the number one threat according to Datto's report. We'll just go over a couple of statistics. 85% of MSPs have reported attacks against their MSP, uh, SMBs, the companies they support in the last two years. That's like, I don't know of one that hasn't had one. So I don't even know who the 15% are or how many clients they have because I think just about all of you have seen a ransomware attack of one kind or another. And it's only getting worse. The idea one in five fall victim to ransomware attack each year. Um, there's all kinds of little reports here and there, ransomware exploded, and it continues to get worse with this new evolution of the risk to confidentiality of the data. Hackers are doubling down on ransomware because they know that you might have good backups, but you can't stop us from publishing your data to the internet, and that means you're more likely to pay the ransom. Okay, 96% of MSPs predict attacks will continue at the current rate or get worse. Um, these, this is the evolution. So these are from 2020. New ransomware leaks confidential data. Ragnar Locker ransomware threatens release of confidential information. Maze ransomware. There's all sorts of different things. And I did this presentation on like July 3rd. This article came out on July 2nd for Xerox because they were hit and their data was stolen. Chubb was hit. All kinds of companies are being hit with this. Okay, so what's driving this attack trend? We look at the attack trends here. This is summary from two different sources. We've got Verizon on the left and Semantic Poneman Institute, their research over each year, they do a research study that says who's being attacked at what percentages. And SMBs, as defined on the right by Verizon as employees, companies with 11 to 100 employees are more, more than 15 times as likely to be attacked. That's an amazing statistic. And of all the attacks, surveyed by Semantic Poneman, uh, it's leveled off at around 65% of the attacks of, of all reported uh, businesses on the SMB, the, this small to medium sized business, which most MSPs fall in that category. So you're one in the same really, because I don't know too many MSPs that have over 100 employees or fewer, there's, a, there's quite a few small shops that have fewer than 11, so that's possible. So what do you think it is that's driving this? Uh, I've got the chat turned off, I, unfortunately, so I can't ask for your participation unless I can turn my sound on, but I think we're going to skip that for today. So I'll just run through the drivers of why SMBs are so commonly attacked. This is um, where I turn to the audience if you're in the room and I would look at you all and I would say, okay, uh, Jeremy or Eyal or Andy, tell me what you think the reasons are. And I want you to think through this exercise yourselves anyways. What's driving these high frequency of attack on SMBs? And I'll start you off with one of the answers, and that's time. Most SMBs, or MSPs for that matter, uh, don't have a lot of time to spend on cybersecurity protections, right? As you roll out new projects, let's say you're migrating some companies' instant messaging technology from Slack to Teams. That's quite common these days because Microsoft's done a really good job improving Teams. I see a lot of MSPs moving to Teams, adopting it. It's free if you're on Office or on O365. So why would you pay for Slack? So that's happening. How much time do you say stop that migration and think about the security implications of properly securing Teams versus what was in Slack and how do you secure that? And maybe that's not a lot of risk there, depending on what data you have, but if you're doing OneDrive or SharePoint and there's a lot of data in those solutions, are you worried and spending a lot of time securing those things? Probably not. On the MSP side and SMB side, you don't have un buckets and buckets of money to spend on security, right? At a bank, I worked at uh, JP Morgan Chase in their payment tech division, and they had um, basically a, an unlimited pocketbook for reducing risk. They did not want to accept any risk of any kind, and they constantly were testing and checking and validating their cyber security footprint. If there was a risk identified, they said, tell us what it cost to fix it, and then they fixed it, right? The big banks are all that way, but they kind of have the deep pockets to do it. Most SMBs SMB, uh, and MSPs don't have deep pockets to spend on money on cybersecurity. And who are you hiring? Are you hiring experts in cyber or, you know, a lot of folks that just graduated university, college, fresh out of school, fresh out of high school, whatever the case may be, 
they may not have a single hour of cybersecurity training. I don't think our schools are doing a good job or doing enough in educating the youth of today on cybersecurity. They don't teach our kids. My, my, I have a 21 and an 18 year old. They had no training on passwords, no training on phishing attacks, no training on social engineering. They might have got something on cyber bullying and sexting, I think. They don't do those things, right? But your employees, you're less worried about them doing cyber bullying, although that's something, than that you are them clicking on a phishing attack. And they are such novices that you're, you need to address that. So you're not creating enough cybersecurity awareness training programs. What we're doing today here is part of that awareness program. What I would hope you do, side note, little commercial break, CyberHoot can do the training for you, fully automated, all of that stuff. That's it for the commercial, back to business. You need to do something around cybersecurity awareness training with your staff at the MSP and your clients uh, in order to address the lack of productivity, the uh, anxiety that the employees have over phishing attacks that come in, was I compromised, wasn't I, you know, all of that stuff. Beyond that, you also uh, need, sorry, you need, you don't have security staff whose responsibility is to oversee your cybersecurity program. So without that, you're missing out on somebody who's guiding you across the board in when you roll out Teams or when you roll out SharePoint or when you um, adopt a password manager like LastPass, how do you secure it? Do you allow password resets by a super admin? Do you notify when two-factor authentication is disabled on your O365 environment? All of these things might be set just by happenstance without someone whose job it is to advise and guide you, right? And what the best practices are. Um, so that's important. Uh, one of the final reasons why an SMB is likely to be attacked or an MSP is what they have access to, right? You as MSPs have access in the back door of, you know, 15, 20, 30, sometimes 50 clients you can get into their environments with the domain admin credentials. So one hack of an MSP and maybe they can gain access to all these other clients that they're interested in. If you remember the target hack years ago, it was the HVAC vendor that supported the um, environmental controls of every target building in the United States, turning the AC up in the summer, the heat up in the winter, that was breached directly and the VPN that they had to those environmental control systems at all those locations was what the hackers rode into the point of sale devices, overwrote the point of sale software, siphoned off 70 to 80 million credit cards and the rest is history. So that was a backdoor breach. Okay, if a picture is worth a thousand words, this picture is worth a thousand words on a cyber program. This is what I would say is the key fundamental pieces of a strong cybersecurity program. You have at the main pillar, you have policies that govern how you uh, operate and how your employees should operate online or at your company uh, through a WISP, a written information security policy, a password policy, acceptable use of computers policy, or an information handling policy. You have policies defined, your employees sign off on them. Those policies live and breathe and, and get updated on an annual basis. And your employees re-sign off on those policies and they're held to account for not complying with those policies. Then you have your people and you have to train your people both on the policies, but also like we're doing today on the types of attacks. In a moment, we're gonna get into two exercises. One is on phishing, the other is on passwords. And those will be part of your training today uh, of things you could build into your training program at your MSP or SMB. Finally, you have technology, not finally. Thirdly, you have a third pillar of technology. We all need to have endpoint protection, whether it's a, a, you know next gen antivirus plus you know, some IDS, IPS, uh, firewalls have to be put in place, spam filters need to be put in place. I would, I always argue that my clients need to implement the banner message that says in the subject, we prepend all external emails with the external uh, um, label and then a, a yellow background header that says, this came from outside the company. So you cannot uh, expect the CEO or the president of this firm to be asking you to go and buy gift cards for end of quarter spiff to our clients, if it come from outside the organization, your CEO would send it from inside. So don't pay attention to that email, delete it, right? 
finally, you notice there's a rock wall at the bottom. There's a, a foundation of a risk management framework, right? Where you want to do an assessment of your firm or your MSP or your client to really understand what kind of data they have. How does it move in and out of the building? How does it at transit and at rest? And then uh, how is it protected? What kinds of protections are required if it's under HIPAA or PCI or CMMC or DFARS or ITAR or you know you name it? Uh, so you need to have a risk management framework in place. So that same picture in words is uh, starting with a risk assessment that's always important. Um, many people say, why start with a risk assessment? I know what my risks are. Well, you have a, such a finite pool of time and money to spend on your cyber program, you really need to address the most critical risks that come out of the obvious output of a risk assessment. Because uh, oftentimes we spend our time working on things that are maybe not the most important thing uh, at MSP. So we want to do that risk assessment and prioritize the findings. Govern with policies, train your people, roll out technology like anti-spam, anti-phishing, anti-virus, anti-malware, uh, advanced web protection, content filtering. Sometimes you could do DNS protection. Right, right now, many of us work with Webroot, which has a DNS protection mechanism built into it that you could turn on. And that helps with some zero day attacks where a hacker has breached a website. If you just visit the website, it tries to send you know, zero day attacks down. I don't know if you heard this earlier this week, Chrome had a zero day attack that could lead to a compromise. Um, fortunately, Chrome auto updates. I checked mine today in advance of this presentation to make sure and I was certain enough it had updated itself. Um, there's a ping of death right now to any Windows device. Microsoft released a patch in o October that fixes an IPv6 malform packet ping of death that can crash a machine. It doesn't compromise the machine, but any data that you have, because it in initiates a kernel panic, your machine just blue screens and you lose everything that you haven't saved. So really important to patch for that. Um, Active Directory controller should have been patched back in August because of a really critical network enabled 10 out of 10 severity bug then. So you need a patch, you need to monitor, you need DNS protections, mobile device management, encrypt your critical data. Password manager is going to be something we talk a little bit more about today and set up two-factor authentication on all critical accounts. <clears throat> and for when the, uh, the proverbial doo-doo hits the fan, you really want to have something that can backstop you in those major catastrophe events like cyber insurance. And uh, actually, here's another commercial. If you want to know what kind of cyber insurance to get, CyberHoot just did a two-part blog article uh, two weeks ago and three weeks ago on cyber insurance. We partnered with a company called uh, Joseph uh, Brunsman, who, shout out to Joe, great guy. He runs, uh, helps run CPL brokers, and he handles a lot of forensic investigations into companies that have been breached, um, unfortunately. And he helped us identify and articulate the kinds of cyber insurance you can buy, because there's over 500 different kinds of riders you can buy, and what it doesn't cover. So the first week's what you should be buying and what you can buy and what's what's recommended. The second week is what does it not cover? What Where are the conflicts? Where can you get into trouble? So a couple of two-part series. If you subscribe to our blog, you'll get this notification. If you subscribe to our newsletter, which we're going to publish, I think Ty has it to publish latest, later this week, uh, you'll get both articles linked in our newsletter. So cyberroot.com, find the newsletter link, put your email in, and you're good to go. Governance programs, policy governance, they need to be automated today. You shouldn't be doing anything on paper anymore. I mean, that's not even, tw that's that's like 20 year old technology in the 19th century, you, we use paper for everything, right? Not anymore. You need a, a fully online solution that sends these uh, policies to your employees via email, gets them to sign off on it like a DocuSign or a CyberHoot has the same electronic signature capability. Uh, those policies need to be maintained. They can't be kept collecting dust on the shelf. And uh, they need to be threat-based so that, you know, they evolve as hackers evolve, where we once said, you know, ransomware, we back things up, we're okay. You actually can't, you can't rely on that anymore. You have to evolve with the threats. This is an example of a screenshot that you get from CyberHoop where you see 100% policy compliance here, seven policies, nine active videos. There's more that have evolved since this time, uh, users and video compliance. So, you know, it's a fully, uh, fully vetted dashboard that you can get there. 
Here's another client that's running these types of policies. You can see things like expense management. A good friend of mine runs the Fellsway Group. Shout out to John. Good job on the Fellsway Group. And uh, weak passwords is where we're going to go next. So training your people. We've talked about policies. Let's go to training people. I want to talk about weak passwords for a moment. Phishing attacks, password managers. So I give this analogy. When we were all kids and in high school, we learned how to type because running a typewriter or learning a computer keyboard was a really important skill that everyone in the educational space said, you need to learn how to do this because everything's going to be run on a computer and a typewriter or a, or a keyboard. So we learned that skill. But that 19th century skill is, is basically, it's really important. But your 21st century equivalent of those skills is cyber knowledge, cyber security skills around passwords, password hygiene, uh, spotting and deleting phishing attacks. These are the kinds of skills you need in order to be successful, productive, confident, um, and secure in the 21st century. So we're going to get into two quick exercises. Here's a bunch of rules for passwords. NIST got it really wrong and they've subsequently amended their guidance. In 2003, a guy at NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology said, hey, you should all have nine character passwords that change every 90 days. They should be uppercase, lowercase, special character and a number and uh, that's the securest password you can get. Uh, but no, that is not because people cheat because we have 400 different accounts to worry about. So how on God's earth are we going to remember two or three really good passwords, let alone 400? So don't ever do the NIST. If you're advising clients now, never adopt nine character, 90 day complex passwords. Go to the new NIST standard, which we'll cover in just a moment. Don't write passwords down. This is often the case where we go in and we do an assessment, we see sticky notes. If it's not just taped to the monitor, it's underneath the keyboard. If it's not underneath the keyboard, it's in the drawer to the right or left of the desk. You know, don't use names of pets, family, friends, birthdays, that sort of thing. And don't reuse your passwords everywhere you go. This is a major no-no for a good password hygiene. If you, if you reuse even the root of your password is the same and then you add a different prefix or suffix to it depending on where you're going, if a hacker can see your password in plain text, they can predict what the password will be at whatever site you're going, they're trying to break into your account on. So don't reuse passwords. And then the soldier, shoulder surfing is just another. In the rem, work from home remote, this becomes less of an issue unless your spouse might be shoulder surfing your password entry. Uh, you don't want to do it. But let's do a test here. For those on the phone um, on this webinar, pull out your browser. Go to this website, Google Have I Been Pwned. Now, listen carefully. Put in your oldest email personal email account that you've used for years and years and years. Put it into that site. It's a safe thing to do. Don't worry. There's nothing that you're going to breach or lose out on. This is not a test of your cyber security skills. This is just a, a proof. Once you put that in there, you're going to see how many times you've been breached, right? I mean, I'll do it just so you know. Um, I think I can shell out. Can I shell out on this? This will be cool. Well, I don't want to put too much information in front, but I'll, I'll share... Yeah, because this is Facebook Live, I'm probably not going to do that. I was going to share my personal address. I just think it's probably best not to because I'll get all kinds of bad stuff sent to me. But this is the Have I Been Pwned website. You plug your name in here. When I started running these tests back in May 2015, it had just over a billion um, usernames and passwords, username, email accounts, and social media profiles, and all kinds of data, about a billion accounts. It's grown like crazy since then. As two years later, it was almost five times as many accounts, almost five billion. Here's a notification you can get if you register your personal email, your work email, you can get notified when you're part of a breach. Here's an example of my breaches, um, you know, showing that I've been part of Dropbox, LinkedIn. Remember the trillion? I'm, I'm, that's how old I am. I'm really old. I've been around a long time. So trillion. Uh, it's actually past 10 billion now. This was uh, from about six months ago, the screenshot. It's now over 10 billion accounts. So it's grown since 2015. Uh, 
1,000% on the publicly disclosed breach data that's in Have I Been Pwned. Now, a lot of security experts and friends of mine say there's probably 10 to 100 times as many uh, accounts in the dark web that aren't publicly disclosed that hackers have access to to try and break into our accounts. So if you think about it, if you're reusing passwords all over the place, all a hacker has to do is get one username and password, try it on a number of different fronts, and maybe break into your company, your MSP, or otherwise. Unless you have 2 FA set up, that's a good protection against that. So we've talked about password, password hygiene, and all the rules. We're going to move to the, the new NIST recommendation says 14 character passwords that don't expire, that aren't complex. That's a pretty, uh, um, what do you call it, heretical recommendation but it stops people from cheating and it works, right? No company right now, none of your employees have 14 character passwords, but when you move to that, they love it because they come up with a passphrase, they can type it in and it's easy for them to remember. They don't have to change it every six months and they're not using it anywhere else. So it's really helping secure and protect your environment. But for most of us, creating more than one or two of those passphrases is really, really hard. So uh, do what I do and adopt and roll out a password manager at your MSP. Dashlane, 1Password, LastPass, they're all free for personal use. Um, so learn it there, build your cybersecurity skill set this way, and then you'll be able to be much more productive, much more secure. You know, I even got clicked into, convinced to click a phishing attack one time to a Facebook page, no, a LinkedIn page. I went to the LinkedIn link that I thought was LinkedIn, but my password manager just sat there dumb as a post, not entering my username and password. And I got pissed off. I'm like, come on, why did you break? My last pass, you should be logging me in right into um, the LinkedIn page. Well, I was in Italy on some LinkedIn lookalike phishing attack website, and I didn't realize it. And had I known my password, I would have typed it in and given it to the hackers. But because I didn't, and LastPass said, well, you're not where anywhere I've ever seen before, so I'm not putting anything in there, I was protected. So these password managers can actually protect you from mistakes even security professionals make. All right, we're going to finish with two more, two more areas. We're going to talk about phishing now for a moment. Then we're going to talk about a, a real live MSP and what they've been faced with and how they've overcome those challenges. And then we'll open it up to Q&A. So, these are two, uh, one of these images is a phishing attack, this left one. The right is a legitimate email from Amazon. And again, I want you to think about and look at the two right now and ask yourself, how can you tell the one on the left is a phishing attack, the one on the right is a legitimate email? And normally in a room, I would have you call things out, but I'm going to just make it easy for you. The first thing is, who sent you an email? Amazon sent the one on the right, but somebody admin at accesssecure.onmicrosoft.com sent the left. Never going to happen. Secondly, they said order processing in the subject line. They always know what I ordered in the race icon bike helmet. I like to do mountain biking and other high biking. So I ordered a helmet. They're going to put that there. So that's kind of odd, but that you can't just on the subject line alone, you can't make a, a determination where you start to get on the, for the from address. Absolutely. If it's not from the right place, delete it. You're being fished. Uh, the generic customer address, hello customer, that's a dead giveaway that you're being fished or you're being attacked. Spelling, punctuation, and grammar. Look at this line down here. If you do not accept, if you do not order this item, please cancel this purchase space. Oops. Then we will take action for the security of your account. There's missing periods. There's spaces between commas. Um, there's probably a typo somewhere in this page, but spelling, punctuation, and grammar, another dead giveaway. Uh, some of the more advanced things, well, there's one more obvious thing. I didn't order anything. So all phishing attacks are typically unexpected and create a sense of urgency within you to do something. They want you to react to the email, to quickly click through and try and address it and move on with your day. So they're urgent, they're unexpected. On the right, I of course ordered this, I was expecting a notification and I got it. Some of the other ones that people have pointed out to me is that this is apparently going to deliver the same day that the order was uh, created, July 16, 2015, 
estimated delivery July 16, 2015. That, as far as I know, we still don't have drone deliveries, so that couldn't be the case. And if you hover over the links over here, you see a bit.ly slash PWPUP. This is a obfuscation technique where the URLs aren't visible to you. You click this and it redirects you to the actual destination. On the right over here, you see amazon.com all over the place if you hover over all these different things. The last thing I'll say is that they didn't advertise to me on the left with things, other things I'd like to buy, right? On the right, you see other mountain biking and bicycling related items. They'd say, hey, other customers bought this. Maybe you want to buy it too. So all of these things, if you just take a moment to deep breathe, ask yourself a few questions, you'll find that you can quickly and easily identify phishing attacks. But we've made it simpler. We've made a codified set of questions for you to ask yourself. If you answer two, yes to two or more of these questions, you're being fished, delete the email and forget about it. What's the worst that could happen? Is the email unexpected? That's number one. Now that alone wouldn't be enough, but is it urgent and wanting some critical action? Those two combined, probably being fished, maybe we wanna check one more. Is it addressed generically? Yes, okay, dear sir, valued customer, do they know my name? Yes, then delete it, you're being fished. Is the sender wrong? Is Amazon sending this message or on Microsoft? Is it full of grammar, spelling, and typos? Are there bad links or embedded links or obfuscated links? How about an enticing or voyeuristic attachment like salaries.xls or tragic pics or what have you? Recently, we've been telling people about COVID stories. You get an email that says, hey, uh, Craig, you've been uh, named in a contact tracing that we're doing. We need you to download this file and fill out the paperwork because we want to contact trace you because you've been exposed to COVID and it's your civic duty. Wow, people are really nervous about that. They're opening these files and they're getting infected with one of those um, bits of malware or viruses. So here's something that we produced at CyberHoot uh, for you to sit on the mouse with your logo at the top. You can put your logo, here's Neoscope. They did this one with their line item and their, you know, their website, phone number, and these things. And hopefully a few of their clients stopped clicking on a phishing attack by reading these lists and, and then deleting it, right? And we've got all kinds of MSPs that uh, CyberHoot doing it, using it. So just a couple sampling of things. So the last thing we're going to cover before Q&A, and I think we have 15 minutes left, so I'm going to be quick on this. Probably five minutes, we'll have 10 minutes of questions and answers. And we'll, we'll do the question and answer if I can figure it out through the um, uh, Q&A section of the Zoom webinar. So maybe take a look at that now. Neoscope is a MSP, you know, three to five, three to five million dollars in revenue, uh, 50 clients and uh, 15 employees. So they're doing a pretty good job. Five years ago, they came to me and said, Craig, we need to do something in the cybersecurity space because we're facing a lot of problems. We have two to three ransomware attacks a month. We need to differentiate ourselves. There's a lot of competition with them between MSPs and we find ourselves coming up against all kinds of MSPs and we need to differentiate why us over them. We're, our staff are getting upset by all these after hour cyber incidents, right? On weekends, family time, uh, af, late on a Friday, got to go restore files due to a ransomware attack. So they're really burning out. We need more monthly recurring revenue. That's your lifeblood of an MSP is monthly recurring revenue. So they needed more or they wanted to generate more of that. And, you know, we want to protect our client attrition. We don't want to lose too many clients at, at Neoscope. We need to add value to our clients. We want to give them things that they feel are valuable. And we, we really want to be able to sleep at night knowing we're doing what we need to do to protect our clients. So this was the situation five years ago. Uh, how did they go? How did they fix it? Well, you know, they didn't. How did they get there? Who knows? Where do they need to get to? A much more cyber secure and, and prepared uh, set of clients. Uh, so let's look at what they did by embedding CyberHoot into their managed service proposals for managed desktop, secure help desk. Uh, they did start out with a line item that almost only seven out of the total set of clients signed up for CyberHoot as a line item. But then they said, no, nah, we're just going to bake it in because the value is so wonderful for us, for our own engineers, for our own staff, for the fewer incidents. 
and there was there just made sense. So they for the last three years, four years, they've baked it into their offerings. And what they've experienced is a reduction in cyber attacks. It's been about two years since they, I'm knocking on wood here, it's two years since they've had a cyber a ransomware attack with one of their clients in CyberHoop. They've been able to go to a lot of the uh, RFP and proposal reviews with a differentiator around cybersecurity and the awareness not only that they can give to their clients through this baked in product, but also their own employees have done hundreds of security videos are governed by policies, monitor their dark web for attacks and reports on exposed accounts, are fish tested so that they keep, they're kept on their toes with phishing tests. All of these things are built into CyberHoot and built into Neoscope security offering through CyberHoot. Uh, their emergency support. So Neoscope has always been flat rate um, MSP services. There's no break fix here. And they, they reduce the cost per client because of fewer incidents um, to those clients that adopted the tool, the awareness training tool. They boosted their monthly revenue, their clients re-signed faster, they shift to a culture that values cybersecurity over other things. And of course the owner, uh, Tim Martin, sleeps much more soundly with some peace of mind around cyber security. So let's review what we've talked about today. We're all MSPs, SMBs are facing increased risks and threats from cyber attack. You all need some kind of a cybersecurity program to roll out to yourselves and your clients to address some of the fundamentals in that set of 10 things you should be doing. Policy, if you remember, we, you need policies to govern. CyberHood has 25 templates that you can just search and replace and adopt for your company pre-written through hundreds of audits, ready to go for you. So that addresses the policy pillar. You have the, um, uh, the training that you need to train on these attacks. Uh, you need to train on the technologies. You need to train on the policies. Uh, CyberHoot recently added a bunch of program training modules on advanced Excel, basic Excel, advanced Word, basic Word, Teams, all these program videos from Microsoft we've built into CyberHoot to uh, help you roll out different technologies and train on the technology uh, that we also have programs from Salesforce and QuickBooks and a few other things. So there's just a lot of things that are built into the product for you that provide you training. Um, you need the benefits of a cybersecurity program. Neoscope did it and they've had really good success and they continue to renew year after year. Their client renewals are up, their attrition is down, their satisfaction and happiness of their most expensive resources or engineers is really good because they're dealing with fewer reactive emergencies and can be more proactive in the work that they do, more value add. So uh, I think we have nine minutes for Q&A. Uh, what I'm going to do is try and open up the Q&A and see if there is anyone that wants to ask a question. And I can also try to allow people. Thank you, Tim. I see a question there or I see a comment. You're welcome. Um, does anybody have a question about this and what you've heard today? There's one more screen I can share with you. Uh, we can get questions and answer them as they come in. If you want more information on CyberHoot, you can certainly book time in my Calendly link, calendly.com slash CyberHoot. You can book a meeting. Um, but I hope you've learned a little bit today just to scroll back to that one screen that is the 10 pieces of a cybersecurity program. Uh, this is where you need to be at with your MSP to be secure is to have this page here under, this is your 10 things for a cyber program. One is the risk assessment, start with that. Uh, Tim asked a question, can you talk a little more about cyber pricing compared to others? Okay, interesting. I had a meeting today where I signed up a client uh, with 550 users that had already been using uh, No Before. And I don't want to put No Before down. It's a great product. It's very, very robust, has a lot of capabilities. But he said, the reason I want to sign with you is because with No Before, I have the Cheesecake Factory problem. And I said, well, tell me what that is. I kind of knew what it was, but he, he explained. There's so many options, so many choices that I get 
para paralyzed at doing anything. I think I have the same three fishing attacks that I've run once a year for the last two or three years. I haven't rolled out the training aspect of it because it's just too complicated and I need their sales engineer to help me out. I don't have that with you, you, you know. So the pricing, and I said, well, what about pricing? To Tim's question, pricing, you're almost comparable or cheaper. Uh, the price for uh, for Cyberhoop for him for his 550 was somewhere around 24,000 for the year. For no before it was around 24, 26,000. So it's very comparable. For companies like yours in the MSP arena, I'm we're not charging anywhere near what we're talking about there with this one client because this is a direct client uh, under Neoscope. I'm charging Neoscope a buck 75 per user per month for their uh, access to Cyberhoot and they're marking it up 100 points to 350 in that case and sometimes more, sometimes less. So there's a lot of really important um, capabilities to mark things up, to make a good MRR and uh, we are cheaper typically than most of our competition out there right now. Hopefully that answered your question, Tim. Anybody have any other questions in the four or five minutes remaining? Andy, Jeremy, Eyal, if you have any questions or you just want to uh, email them to me, I'd be happy to answer that. I'd be happy to meet with you. Anybody else on the call, please do. Or if you uh, come upon this Facebook Live recording, just go to the last page of the last slide of the uh, presentation and you'll be able to um, get, book a meeting with me at uh, calendly.com slash cyberhoot. It's really hard to, to scroll through these quest webinar presentations. I can go fast. There you go. There's the link. So without any more questions, we'll probably call this to an end. And uh, thank you all for your time. And I wish you the best cybersecurity you have. My pleasure, EL. Thank you for the uh, feedback. I appreciate it. Take care, everyone.